Choice means to me that a woman has complete control over her reproductive system and over her own body. I think the phrase that was used 25 years ago, our bodies ourselves, is still a phrase that could be used today. To be pro-choice right now in Davis for me means to fight very hard to defend women's reproductive rights. It means to make sure that no woman ever has to go to see a doctor and run, a ga run through a gauntlet of people who dislike her, who think that she's a bad person, who want her to rethink a decision she's thought very hard about, who think that she's not capable of making that decision in the first place. For a man, being pro-choice means you as a male don't believe that you have the right to tell other women what they can do with themselves. And being anti-choice means that because men have been able to tell women what to do with themselves for a long time, you think it's okay to continue to do so. For me, what being pro-choice means, means that I support and defend the values of democracy, of pluralism, of self-determination, of human dignity. Um, of the belief that people have the intelligence and the uh, sense of morality individuals do to make um, very good moral decisions about their lives, about the most important decisions of their lives, and that as is only appropriate to a democracy that the realm of privacy, of sexuality, and reproduction are areas that are inviolable by the state and are areas that only individuals can make um, and take responsibility for in their lives. To me, pro-choice means for choice. It means that every individual owns the right 
to make their own decisions in private regarding their value system and their reproductive rights. Pro-choice to me does not mean pro-abortion or anti-abortion. It merely means that every individual owns the right to make that choice in private. Well, for me, it's a fundamental expression of the fact that women have complete freedom as a person to express themselves any way they want. involved in the issue of reproductive rights because I think it's an affront to our dignity to have someone else decide anything for us, let alone something so fundamental as bearing a child and as follows caring for that child. So to me, if we go back to saying somebody else gets to make that decision for us, we're chattel. We really are the property still of somebody else. In other words, we're a vessel for life, hopefully male life. And that to me is disgusting, it's abhorrent, I won't tolerate it, I will fight it. I officially got involved in the struggle for reproductive rights five years ago working for Planned Parenthood in first in Yolo County in, in Sacramento and then in San Diego when I moved down there. But I really became involved in reproductive rights when I was a freshman in college. A very good friend of mine got pregnant when we were living on the dorm and she was a really together woman. She knew what she wanted, she knew where she was going and she knew a lot of what it was going to take to get there and she knew that she wasn't in any position to have a child. She also knew that there weren't going to be a lot of people around her who understood that. So she came to me, which is something I didn't appreciate then, that that was an honor and that that meant something. And then I think I appreciated that she trusted me, but now my understanding of the situation has changed so much. And I took her, she, so she came to me, told me what she needed. I helped her find out how to get an abortion and I took her, drove her to Woodland and I sat and waited outside because the man by whom she was pregnant decided that he couldn't handle it at this time in his life. I sat outside with her. I sat outside in the, in the office waiting for her and watched her as she came out that door and saw her face and saw the, the tremendous sense of, of choice on her face, if you can see choice. She looked like she'd made a choice, for better or for worse, for right or for wrong, she had made a choice and that empowered her to go and live her life. I became involved in the pro-choice movement because when the Supreme Court through the whole issue of abortion back to the states. It was frightening. It was frightening because my generation did not have this option. My generation did not even have the pill. My generation used back alley abortions as they have and still do all over the world frequently. And I found that a grossly repulsive uh, situation. Also, my generation did not have options. We had very, very few options. And I think if anything else, what we need to pass on to our future generations of women is the option to have some control over their lives on their reproduction. I, I suppose really for quite some time I figured that I would get involved in the reproductive rights struggle if the right opportunity presented itself. And it presented itself in spades about a year and a half ago when these local anti-choice, I'll, I'll say extremists, and that's quite a euphemism, uh, invaded Dr. Skimmel's medical center over here planted themselves all around the front door, said terrible things to women that were coming and going like you're murdering your baby or you've murdered your baby, uh, 
made all kinds of phony prayer noises directly in front of the front door, obviously contrived theatrical stuff, uh, hung gory pictures out all over the place, uh, really vicious things. I mean, these are not kind, loving Christian people. These are mean, oppressive people. And when I saw that, and I found out that it was happening on private property, and that's illegal, but our district attorney was not enforcing applicable trespass laws, uh, even though every single educated legal person who investigated the matter told him, hey, you're wrong, this is against the law, he still didn't enforce the law. I, I did not feel it was something I could turn my back on. I, I learned just from direct experience at an early age how, how women's lives are structured. Uh, through unwanted childbearing into different directions and too often in more negative directions. As I became a feminist and was introduced to feminist ideology in the early 1970s, um, the whole thing just clicked for me and I realized in my own life how my life would be very structured by unwanted childbearing and inversely how um, and also a very important level of that too is how my class background and how my not having a lot of money would would give rise to even a greater impact uh, when it comes to childbearing. I think that what finally clicked in my own mind that really got me involved was one night on national TV I was watching um, the news and a uh, legislature someplace in the country was coming to a decision around the issue of abortion. And I looked at the picture that was on the screen and what I saw was all men deciding what was going to happen to my body. And I said, no. I re don't remember if my mind went blank, but all of a sudden I felt a fury and an anger, and I said, no. And it was after that that I became very active around this issue. No change without struggle. No one in power ain't giving up nothing. No change without struggle. No one in power ain't giving up nothing. There are many impacts that this issue has specifically on the Davis community. Number one, I think the impact is that women are beginning to stand up. This is not an issue that women can be complacent about. This is not an issue that women cannot care about. This is our bodies and we have to be active. One impact that could be particularly crucial, I think, for Davis residents is that in 1987, California passed the Parent Consent Law. It has been bogged down into, in the courts, but next year we expect it to be decided. Right now, a minor woman, young woman, has the right to go get an abortion. If this law becomes law and in, is put into effect next year, young women will have to get the consent of a judge or one parent, as it stands right now in the law, to be able to have an abortion. And the impact is going to be in this community next year that Sutter Davis Hospital is going to be filled with our teenagers, my teenagers, Davis residents' teenagers, with botched abortions, maybe on the verge of death because abortion is not legal. I think the most important thing anybody can do is to educate the general public because there are a lot of anti-choice newspapers and television stations out there who do not want you to know what the religious far right is doing in this country. Uh, there are other newspapers, and we've got one right here in Davis, that want to paint this Pollyanna picture of the world and put out this I'm okay, you're okay, everybody's okay message to people. And I'm sorry, that's just not the truth. It would be lovely to believe that, and it might sell newspapers, but it's garbage. The fact of the matter is, the religious right, actively involved in trying to abrogate 
all sorts of freedoms. The freedom, the freedom to have birth control is the next thing they're going to want to go after. That is not okay. And the public needs to be made aware of the fact that that's what these people want to do and that they are militantly devoted to their cause. They will walk through machine gun fire to do this if they have to. They are scary people. And it's an all-out war we're in. I don't think they can win because they're badly outnumbered and when you get right down to it, if you, if you talk to the American public about the idea of taking away birth control and taking away abortion rights and, and uh, taking away women's equal employment rights, the American public would overwhelmingly reject those ideas. It's completely unacceptable. The issue of religion and, and reproductive rights is twisted and very messy for me personally these days. I grew up a very spiritual child in a very loving family that called our, our family spirituality Christianity, but never forced it on us. We weren't forced to go to Sunday school, we weren't forced to go to church, but we talked about the good things in life, the good energy, the good spirit, and what made us love each other as God. And I grew up believing in that God. And for lack of a better word, I knew there was something that, that meant the closeness and the love that I felt being in my family. And then I started hearing those same people using the same word that I thought I knew what it meant, saying that God hates what this woman has done, that my friend in college was hated by God because of the choice she made to take care of her life. And I thought that God was the one who helped her to walk through that door to make the right choice to know what to do with her life. Now, as I go to the clinics, as I have to interact with people in the community who say they are powered by God, I find myself denying any involvement with that God. The God that talks love and acts hate isn't a God that I can understand. And while I know there are churches who are much closer to the God I grew up understanding, I don't understand where they are and why they're not here. I'm in the doctoral program in sociology, and I have found that my work in sociology tends to feed into my work in reproductive rights in some, some ways and that my reproductive rights work can also feed into my sociology. And most recently I've uh, finished what's called a qualifying paper um, which looks at, at Operation Rescue and uh, Randall Terry who is the uh, fellow who ex-used car salesman who formed OR in 1987. And what I tried to do was compare them to um, do, you know, research and analysis in, to compare them with um, the uh, civil rights movement and uh, Gandhi, Gandhi and King, which they have compared themselves to in the media over and over again, and in, in a sense have, have claimed the kind of the moral legitimacy that Gandhi and King worked very, very hard to accomplish. As I did my research, I found that uh, there are they're almost, the ideology and the actions in many ways are almost diametrical opposites. For one thing, Gandhi and King never blockaded a clinic. Um, for one thing, uh, Gandhi considered blockades a, a form of violence. What they did was a sit-in, where you would just go in and you'd occupy, you know, say a lunch counter where, where blacks didn't have a right to go, but you didn't stop whites from coming in. Now what OR is doing is blockading, which is preventing people uh, from the freedom to, to walk or enter a specific area, which is actually an extremely coercive action, and as I said, is considered violence by Gandhi. They also are, are quite different in their attitudes about uh, violence and about punitiveness. And it's very important to, to note that with Gandhi, there's no separation really between the principle and the action. It's all an interrelated process or a technique which he called satyagraha. And in the satyagraha technique, um, you can't be violent because, or punitive because his belief is that no individual knows the absolute truth. Therefore, you don't have the right to punish. Now, when you look at OR, they believe they have the absolute truth and they're extraordinarily punitive. They believe in capital punishment. I've talked to OR members that believe that um, physicians should be executed for performing abortions. Randall Terry, in his book, which is called Operation Rescue, um, really interestingly cites uh, an example of looking at the ancient mosaic law about blood, what he calls blood guiltiness and compares contemporary abortion to um, child sacrifice in Israel. 
and actually says that according to the Mosaic Law, the only way that the people of the nation could be freed if they allowed this to happen and they didn't intervene and stop it was to kill the murderers. Now this is an implication which is extremely violent. Um, he's also said in a Washington Post article that he, it's not that he disapproves of violence but he thinks it alienates the American public. So for those reasons, you know, they haven't been openly violent. When one compares against the tactics, there's a lot of pushing and shoving, injuries have occurred. Um, there's, there are isolated incidences of uh, people being punched, of uh, antis, <clears throat> excuse me, throwing themselves down in front of women, trying to block them and knocking women over, pregnant women. Um, you know, and again, you know, classic nonviolence, you don't touch people, you don't push people, you don't shove people. So in so many ways, they're just, you know, what, what they have tried to do is to use the moral legitimacy of Gandhi and King as a front. And I think they were successful for a while, but I think a lot of people are catching on to what they're doing now. The, the most important reason I, be, I, I think that this resolution is important is, first of all, for the options. I think it is extremely important that women of future generations have the options, as many options available to them as possible. I think what disturbs me very much is that the options of good birth control methods are being blocked. And I think this is, this, this is something that we should all be worried about because not only because of the freedom that women would have, but also, also because of the worldwide ecology and environmental problems we face. Africa now has millions and millions and millions of acres of, of dry land that has absolutely been devastated because of the overpopulation. And, and because of the overpopulation, you have overgrazing. The Amazon forests are being cut down because of the overpopulation and people who want farm plots and need farm plots. Many, many, many of the destructions of our environment throughout the world are caused by overpopulation. The pro-choice resolution was important. It was important for Davis, it was important for California, uh, it was important for the country, and it was important for many individuals. And that's as important as anything I mentioned. People after the Webster decision, I think, took heart that they needed to take to the streets, to take to politics. Under Roe v. Wade and under the interpretation of the California Constitution's right to privacy, we became complacent in California. Yes, we have the right to abortion. We took that for granted. We have the right to choose about that. And what Webster said was, those who wished to move this in the political arena had a victory. They had a victory because it shoved the decision back down into the states. And really, there are laws on the books in California which still say, they've never been removed, that say it's illegal to have an abortion, except for a therapeutic abortion. And so what has allowed us to have the choice in California, other than Roe v. Wade, is this interpretation of privacy. So it was important that since the question had been moved into the political arena, to have a victory in the political arena. And in Davis, we were able to do that. Now we've led the way in many, many areas. And so it was important to lead the way in the political arena to say, you don't have power in this city and you don't have power in this state to take away our fundamental rights. And to prove that to you, we're gonna pass a resolution which declares the status quo. Now there's nothing radical about declaring the status quo. This is a society that a toil has built. What would it take to make the home a right? What would it take to legalize? Why don't we have 
In a nutshell, choice means exactly what it says. It means that people have options and, and have the ability and reason to make intelligent decisions and they should have the freedom to do so. Sometimes she could see the food turning in his mouth when he ate. She would stare directly at it, how it turned like a cement mixture, until she knew it was what annoyed her most about him. She never pointed it out, letting him irritate her until she refused to take her meals with him. She ate by the sink, over the pots, or the back to him. There were times when she could not stand the sound, saliva wetting down his food, lips slick with grease. She would smile at him. Now go ahead, baby. I'm not hungry. Yet with her back to him and the radio on a bit too, too loud, she could still see and hear the hole he made in his face, how he rolled food in it, churning her meals into a gray paste. After he pushed his plate away, a heavy, thick tension rose from her shoulders, and her jaws would go slack. Three meals a day, 21 meals a week. One day, after lasagna, she left him abruptly, saying only that she met someone new and how horribly, terribly sorry she was. He always knew love was complex. She came to know it was the little things that mattered.
I love that story. And uh, it, it was a wonderful thing. I, I went on a lot of radio shows because the only free airtime in New York, I lived in New York then, is the midnight to 6 a.m. Uh -huh. So I did all of the late night shows because the late night people, if you're in the radio anyway, are the intellectual people. That's right. I mean, you get a lot of nuts out there too. But the late night people basically are interested in something they're insomniacs. Uh -huh. And I invited everybody to come down to Birdland. Right. I, don't, I don't chose Birdland because my mom's a jazz fan. Mm -hmm. And Birdland is on uh, 48th and uh, Broadway. Uh -huh. And people, you know, and I didn't expect that kind of crowd. But people showed up and they came down and then they cro came down like this on Broadway and then they crossed the street like that. So we had. I had about 300 people out for a book party. New York Times is at 48th Street. Uh -huh. And so when the Times looked down, they were saying, what's going on down there? And somebody said, oh, I don't know, it's a book party with some Italian or something. Like, what? Right. And so they had to come down and find out that it was me. So I made the, uh, I made the second, the Times comes in the first page, uh -huh. and then the second news front is Metro. And I, I had the picture on the Metro. Oh, that's it was very good. I mean, it was, it was, it was very helpful. It was you, very validating. Were you, were you shocked at the turnout? What, what happened? What I was a little surprised there? because you never know when you do late night radio, you don't know who you're reaching. Mm -hmm. And you don't know how people are going to respond because you're asking night people to come out in the day. Uh -huh. And then you're asking somebody to come out for poetry. Uh -huh. what, what kind of importance do you put on the poetry reading? Um, and, and how do you prepare for it? I'm on a tour right now so that I'm, I'm reading uh, constantly. Mm -hmm. But it's important to read your poetry. Um, I saw that Chicago, I'm always laughing about Chicago, but they've been doing what they call poetry slams lately. Uh -huh. They're bringing people into the bars and they're having like a poetry throwdown and the audience in the bar or in the club is finding the winners. The winner wins $50, the second place 25 the third place 10 It's not the money, it's the involving people. That's right. And for poetry, it's like music. You That's have right. to involve people. Right. And so I'm glad to see it. It's not new. Everybody acts like the poetry slams are new. Langston Hughes, back in the 40s and 50s, read to people. It's something that poetry's always said. It's something that people like me have always done because people have no way of hearing poetry unless you're reading it to them. That's they right. will then take the book and read it. But read it. I think it's important for you to be able to read your own poetry. I had a long conversation with a man who asked me, why can't you write and leave the color out of it? In other words, why do you have to write about black women, black men, black problems, or, or the races? Uh, and what would your response be to somebody say something? That's who I am. That's right. And it's no point in pretending. I never trusted people that said I'm colorblind, I don't notice color. You have to notice color if you can see. And even if you can't, Ray Charles or Stevie Wonder, who are blind, notice is color because it's in our voice, it's in our hair, it's in the texture. Color is there. The question is, do we respect the differences that color brings? That's right. Who are the authors that got you going? Well, you realize, you know, we came up at a time that there weren't so many authors. They were very specific and very particular. Fortunately, when I went to college, for example, Arna Von Tom was the librarian at Fisk. And of course, Arna was a good friend of Langston Hughes. My writing teacher was John Killens at Fisk. So, you know, you had a lot of writers around and I've always been a reader. But I really think that the most important influence in terms of me being a writer is my mother and my, my, my grandmother. Because they were the people that said, oh, this is wonderful, you do that. And they always liked your stories, I always liked your poetry. And then, you know, your mother's always saying, oh, isn't she smart? And so you basically you write for your mom. That's right. Yeah. They're the storytellers. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank you for talking to us. Well, thank, thank you. you. I've enjoyed I've it. Enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Jess. She's going to do a fade. All right.
like to see women portrayed in the media doing real things. I think that, I think that uh, to a great extent, like in sitcoms, I see women doing very little, sort of standing around talking to each other, and I think that's kind of glad. And um, I'd like to see all different kinds of women in the media, too. I'd like, I'd, I'd like to not just see, um, you know, Roseanne being the one, the one, you know, the one woman on TV who has got a different kind of body and, and she's funny. I'd like to see. I, I just like to see more diversity and not and not just think that there's only one way to be. I guess I'd like to see women, uh, women who struggle, who are, especially now in the last ten years in women who are struggling with what it is we're supposed to be doing and what it is we think we're supposed to be doing and how things have changed and um, how people are weathering the, the transition um, in the way that society sees them and the things that they're expected to do or that decide that for themselves that they want to do. Um, you know, because it's a struggle and it's not easy and uh, that's sort of never portrayed. People on television are either uh, very successful executives or brain surgeons or they're, um, you know, at, at home, uh, you know, taking care of kids and uh, having a hard time doing anything else. And I, I think we're all a combination of all kinds of things. The first thing that comes to my head is wanting the media to portray women as being really strong and as being, having an inner power rather than having to depend on somebody else. Um, I think in the past, the media has tended to not portray a really positive image of women, but but portray them in a way as being dependent, as a way of not being as strong as men, um, you know, not being able to balance their checkbooks or whatever. So I would really hope that the media um, really brings that out, and that I think see that as a way of empowering women. If women can read role models of other women that have made it in the world, or that. Um, you know, have done whatever, are following their own path, um, then I think that that could be a really big thing for our social change. Um, using the media as a way of, again, empowering women. I would like to see women in the media with less makeup, uh, real clothing, <laughs> Not silk blouses and linen jackets and perfect pantyhose and, and uh, s shoes with no scuffs and perfect hair that's all poofed up and hair sprayed on and all sticky and never moves in the wind like mine does now. Um, I'd like to see women who have freckles and women who have um, all sorts of different shaped bodies, not real skinny, twiggy. Women, um, I'd like to see women who fail, who, who aren't the perfect uh, homemaker and full-time worker and mom and super-duper house cleaner. Um, I'd like to see women, port women support women so that women who stay at home with their children have as much respect from women who work full-time and vice versa. I'd like to see women be their own best friends and and associates and not fight against each other and be their own worst enemies, which I, I see over and over again. I would like to see, like in the media, if we're talking about movies and TV shows and things like that, I would like to see women capable of standing on their own two feet more. Like there's a lot of, a lot of movies where women are like in 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 um, physical violating positions, women just are not portrayed as being able to deal with it. They always like grab a gun and freak out and faint and run around in their high heels and negligees and can't deal with it. And I think it sends out a real bad message to women that we aren't able to fight back and protect ourselves. And I, I think that we can protect ourselves. When I'd like to see women portrayed uh, as, as dimensional personalities instead of these flat-figured caricatures.
that women who, young women who are coming up, viewing these flat figure dimensions and are trying to, fo are trying to foster those roles because that is all they are seeing, that's all they perceive. Um, young girls, children, trying to be the Barbie, having to have the Barbie lifestyle. I would like to see women portrayed as artists, as politicians, as, as uh, working women with strong views, uh, dimensional, multi-tiered uh, personalities. And we're not getting a lot of that. I would like to see the focus taken away from the nylons and the toilet cleaning into um, the changes and the, and the great desires that women have, but the concerns that we have in this world. Uh, where would we like to take the politics of this country? Our concerns for the women in the third world. Um, that's not portrayed between the hours any hours, especially between the soap opera hours and the prime time. Sister. 